Hi! Today at the shop we're working on a new tone N2561 N2562 master station. This was sent in by a customer for general repair. It's a little bit old and tired and if you listen really carefully on a remote station, we have one remote station hooked up. We'll hold it up here. You can hear a fairly pronounced buzz through the system, and that's a good indication of it being old and tired. So this unit was made in the beginning of 1970, and it's a, an F model chassis. The 2561-62 was one of the longest production models that Newton ever made, and it's also the model that holds the title for having the highest number of chassis revisions during its production life. There are no fewer than eight different chassis designs that were used in the course of when it was first introduced in 1961 until it was discontinued towards the end of 1974. It was originally introduced in 1961 it was simply a 2561-62, but about a year later they added the N in front of the model number and it became an N2561, N2562. The original version in 1961 has no chassis letter. It's considered an A model because it's the very first one, but they're not stamped A. They're just 2561-62s. Then it went through revisions. The N2561-62 is the first one with a chassis letter, and that's the B chassis. And then there's also a C and a D chassis. Primarily, if you had to group all of the changes that were done to the chassis throughout those four versions, Primarily what they were doing was chasing better FM receptions by improved FM tuner designs. Then we reached the E chassis, and the E chassis was the first fundamental change in the underlying design of the 2561-62. The two prominent changes that were made are they changed the power supply design to a positive power supply instead of a negative power supply, and that was a very fundamental change. And also at that time they changed over to all silicon transistors. Previous models all had germanium transistors, so that was a common changeover that a lot of manufacturers were making because silicon transistors were better quality and, and could be higher power and you could do more with them than germanium transistors. Curious notes about the changeover in transistor style is that while it's sort of technically true, it's not entirely true because it wasn't until the H chassis that the output transistors were changed over to silicon. And this F chassis here, it has germanium output transistors in it still. Going down the road through production after the F model like this, or F chassis, we had an H chassis, a J chassis, and a K chassis. This is one of two finishes that were available up until about 1971 or so. They were available in either the silver with black or there was also the gold with black finished master stations. And then starting in the 70s, this, the styling remained the same, but the finishes were different. They were available in, and you'll remember this if you grew up in the 70s like I did, we had avocado green, we had harvest gold, and we had brown. And in those units, the, the styling on the knobs and the radio dials changed somewhat to make them more modern looking. Also on those units, the speaker grill here, while this is a smooth painted black finish, they had sort of a flocked, fuzzy kind of finish over the grill that probably looked good when it was new in the 70s, but the problem with those are it tends to wear away when it gets touched and then you can see the plastic underneath it. This particular unit has the optional extra faux wood plastic trim around the face plate, which makes the set dimensionally larger and it covers up the silver face plate, which is underneath. This was an extra item that you could purchase and put on any of the units. I think by the time we got to the mid, the early 70 models in the three different colors, I don't believe this was available to buy any longer. It was really for the original units. 2561-62 was the first decentralized system that Newtone made, which means you had more control functions on the remote speakers than other models at that time. So if we go down it quickly here, the top knob is your main on-off power switch and your volume and tone adjustment. You can hear the 
noisy volume controls, volume and tone adjustments for the entire system that would be considered your system volume control for radio level throughout the house. You have your input selector here. We have phonograph, AM, FM, and it's FM automatic frequency control or standard FM. FM AFC helps prevent the tuner from drifting once you've tuned in a station and it's reasonably effective. We have the master speaker volume, which is the volume control for the built-in six by nine speaker here. Then we have our intercom control switch here. We have three positions. We have what they used to call standby. Standby turns the radio off at that location, but the intercom would still function. So later that would have become intercom only. And then we have the center position, which is radio and intercom. And then we have monitor which puts that station into a monitor mode and sounds in that room would be heard through the other speakers on the system. Down here we have our inside intercom control talk and listen and outside which are door talk and listen controls here. And then we have two separate tuning dials. We have the AM dial on the top and the FM dial on the bottom. A quick look at the back of the unit. This is sitting the right way. This is the top. It's a fairly straightforward design. We have the back of the speaker cone here. Behind this part of the, the secondary chassis is the intercom board. Over here is the primary power supply and a secondary power filter capacitor. Over here we have the FM tuner. This is the AM tuning condenser. Primarily this board here at the top with these coils that hang down. This is primarily all radio. It's all the adjustments. is all part of the AM and FM radio design. And then down here through the center, we have our different control switches that match up with the knobs on the front. So this particular unit, it's been owned by the fellow who sent it to me since it was brand new in 1970. And he told me before he sent it in that someone, he thinks about 30 years ago, had a little bit of go at it because they had a problem with it. He didn't remember exactly what the problem was, but this particular part right here, this large capacitor right here, this is not factory. This was added in at some point and it was added in to bypass this one down here, which I would guess apparently somebody thought had failed, which would be kind of unusual if it was 30 years ago because these generally aren't really very problematic. And I don't know if we can actually wiggle that out of there or not. If we take this screw out, we can loosen up the other part of the power supply board and maybe get it out of the way just a tad so I can reach in there and see if we can wiggle this out. It's in there pretty good. Oh, there it goes. This is one large capacitor and it's a style that they used to use back in the day. It's actually a cardboard body. Apparently whoever worked on this couldn't find one of these or perhaps they had one of these lying around and they just wanted to use it up. I don't know. Uh, I'm not really a big fan of this type of modification and also things flopping around. This was actually fastened in place. It was tied very nicely with some cord and it was done neatly. I'll give you that, but it's not really the right way to go. So I looked around a little bit. One of the problems with this type of model is there's not a lot of extra room in here. You've got to really work with the space that you have. And so I searched around a little bit online and I came up with this. And this, and this, like this way, these are a really good match. It's almost exactly the same size. It's a little smaller in diameter, but the clamp that holds it in place is adjustable, so that should be okay. So we'll be putting the blue one in, in place of the black one, and then we can reattach the wires correctly and restore it back to what its original configuration was. Here you're looking at the FM tuner assembly, and the FM tuner was one of the reasons they were chasing chassis updates all the time. They were trying to improve the tuner design. I have a feeling that they probably didn't perform as well as they wanted them to, or perhaps I, they were much more expensive to produce than they should have been, or they thought they could refine them and build it better with less parts. The original tuner designs in these models, the tuner can is almost twice as big as this one. And by the time we get to here in 1970, this tuner 
is basically the same tuner that they had been using since about 1968 or so. And it's a common part that's used in models like the 2090 and 2540 and other sets like that. The task here is to rebuild this little N2561 2562. We're going to disassemble it all. We're going to renew and replace all the age-related components that fail. We're going to go through and test it properly. We'll wash and clean the faceplate. We'll clean up all the knobs because their little grooves all get filled up with gunk from your fingers and that's pretty uh, unsightly. And uh, when we get it all put back together and make sure it plays properly. We'll do a little tweaking on the tuners. Right now it's not bad, but when it does play, it does receive well, which is a good sign. However, when it plays, particularly FM, it doesn't sound clear and crisp as you would want it to. It's a little bit distorted, and I think that's just simply age for the unit because you have to remember, it's almost 50 years old, which is kind of weird because when I first started doing this, these were the sets we worked on all the time, and they were only like 20 years old then. So, Gosh. Anyway, so on with the rebuild. When I'm, if I find anything interesting along the way, I'll shoot it. Otherwise, I'll see you at the end. Ooh, look. Proper backlights on the radio dials. How's that for something that looks really cool? Especially at night when all the lights are turned off. So here's our completed Newtone N2561 N2562 F chassis master station. Everything I found wrong with it was pretty much either age related because it's from 1970 or things that someone did to it, which wasn't very nice. So let's go over it really quick and I'll show you that it works properly. And then I'll show you some of the interesting things that I found in it. So I have it turned on. You already saw the backlights because that was one of the things I found that someone did something to it. So we'll switch, it's already turned on. We'll switch the AM on. And proportion uh, into our and head. And it plays well. Of course, power is not infinite. We take not be one player away, but you'd yeah. be a lot closer yeah. to be one Tunes properly. AM reception at the shop, not so good right now. We'll switch over to FM. Tonight, uh, we have an increase in, of clouds and a chance of... And this is a KPFA 55 special. In this hour, we are playing highlights from business. Great, great, and I do, we appreciate the time. Cause nothing's going right, and everything's a mess. A little hard to find FM stations to shop in the upper end. All of that is just sort of weak reception at the shop. Simply the best place to buy a mattress. Zon yeah, it's simply the best. All right, so now it functions correctly. I have it set up with its one remote station. So it's very simple. Inside talk. Inside listen. Door talk. They're very close to each other. So we get some feedback, door listen. Same, that's fine. Oh, we should do it this way. Uh, monitor, works properly. We've, if we put it on standby. We're prepared for the last heat wave and get ready for the chill of winter. With turns the radio off at the master and remote stations, but the intercom still functions, so that's fine. And then from our remote station, same thing. Talk. Here, listen from the front door. Talk inside. Listen. No listen on the remotes. It doesn't work that way. Hands-free reply is only to the master station, even though on all the stations it says special listen. And when you push the inside intercom switch to special listen, you would expect to be able to hear the reply from the remote speakers, but that's not how it works. What special listen is for is if we put rooms on standby, and then we do special listen, you have hands-free reply from all stations. So it's talk, 
to the master, and when you move it to special listen, you can hear the reply from remote stations. So it's a trade-off. It's not true fully hands-free reply because you can't have the music turned on when you're using it. But that was the best they could do when it first came out in 1961. So that's all right. So it functions correctly. So what did we find wrong with our little N2561-62? Well, all of the age-related problems are exactly what you would expect. It had a lot of components in it that were old and tired and original from 1970, which is almost 50 years old. So all of those were replaced. The substitute capacitor that was added into the set in place of the original one, and this was done, don't know exactly when, but as near as I can tell if this is a date code, this was done, now the fellow told me he did this 30 years ago, or someone did it 30 years ago. So this may not be a date code on here. I, it's really hard to tell. It's not a brand that I'm really familiar with, but one of the problems with this was, this was the wrong value. So we now have restored it back to its original value, which is much better. It wasn't so far off that it would have caused a problem, but originality counts for a lot around here. The other thing that I found that someone did, someone had sort of a go at this, maybe it was 30 years ago, but I think it was more recently than that. What I found was, let's do this one, I found two capacitors that look like this. And these are radial capacitors. Radial capacitors are a cylinder, and the leads both come out the bottom. And this type of design uses entirely what call, are called axial capacitors, which the capacitor is the cylinder that I'm holding, and then you have a lead coming out each end like axles on a car. So early electronics, everything was pretty much axial capacitors because that's what they had in those days. And what somebody did was they went in and they replaced two small capacitors with two radial capacitors. And while in a pinch you could get by with doing that, this was not done even in a reasonably good workmanship-like manner because instead of desoldering the original component completely and removing the entire thing and then putting the leads of the new component in the holes and soldering it in properly even if you have to bend the leads out a long ways and you end up with this weird antler shape thing going on what they did was you can see right here they snipped the leads off the end of the axial capacitor and they sort of twisted the new leads onto the end just a little bit and put a blob of solder to hold it together. Uh, this is not acceptable. This is, this is not, no, sorry. This doesn't even pass any kind of quality control. This is laziness, if nothing else, because getting the, the, the original part, it's not that hard. It's all right there in front of your easy to work on set. So not good at all. The other thing I found, which was odd, was these are the two dial lights that were in it. Now, 2561s, 2562s, whether it's the original or it's the end model, they use miniature lamps number 161s. And these are called wedge bulbs because they don't have a metal base. They have this wedgy end of glass on them and the leads are bent over and they fit in a specific type of socket. So again, they use miniature lamps number 161. These are not 161s, these are replacement lamps. These are 259s. 259s are not the correct lamp. I, I didn't bother looking up all of the voltages, but I'm pretty sure that the 161s, I think are 28 volt lamps and these are 12 volt lamps. So what somebody thought would be a really good idea was they hacked in line a big old giant 5 watt ceramic resistor as sort of a brute force method way of dropping the voltage to the bulb so the 259s wouldn't burn out in, I don't know, three and a half days or something. Uh, again, no, I don't think so. Not even close to being right, especially because getting the right bulbs, it isn't that hard. So let's not do um, hacky work. Let's do quality work. And I took the resistor out and I put the correct bulbs back in. And as you saw, we have proper dial lights. I also cleaned up all the controls and all the switches so they're not noisy anymore, which if you look at the first part of the video, video, you'll see the volume controls and things are somewhat noisy. After it was all re I 
cleaned the faceplate, I cleaned all the knobs, I cleaned all the grooves to get all the crud that builds up in them out of them. Uh, I used a little bit of our uh, plastic shine up liquid to help sort of gloss up the knobs a little bit so they look a little bit nicer because they get kind of dull when they get old. Put it all back together, tested it and it worked. And what I found is what I find in most of these sets from this era. The AM tuner, it was pretty much spot on, worked well, not a problem at all. The FM tuner, it was a little on the weak side. It would only pull in really the one single strongest FM local station that we have and everything further up the dial from that didn't really come in very well. It was there, but it was really, really kind of weak. Here on the back of the unit, this is our FM tuner and it's a fairly common Newtone FM tuner that they started to use in the models that came out around 1965 or so. So it's not an unknown animal. It's a fairly regular little beast to work on. And I did what I usually do, which is I don't do a full blown alignment of the tuner because I know that's not really necessary. Doing a full blown alignment is a very time consuming thing to do. And for the most part, if you've worked on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these, you don't need to do that. You know what happens and why the, the reception is poor. It always has to do with the front end of the FM tuner. So we simply do what I call tweak it up a little bit, which is you know which adjustments need to be compensated. And the reason you're compensating is because components in the tuner, mostly the transistors, the FETs, they drift over time as they slowly age and that affects the alignment in the front end and that's why it doesn't pull in and process the signals as well as it should. So with a little bit of e -e 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 tweaking, um, the reception is now very much even between the AM and the FM. And that's really the um, sort of gold standard, the way you judge it. You should be able to receive all of the stations at the shop that you normally can receive and the output volume, which is really based on the input signal of either the AM or the FM tuner be typically within 10% of each other. So if the AM radio plays at 100, your FM tuner better play at 90 at a minimum. Anything less than that, it's either got a real problem or it's not tweaked properly. This one, very clearly, it's probably 190, 195. It's very, very close. We'll occasionally have a set that comes in where the FM tuner is in really, really bad shape and it needs replacement parts, which nowadays is kind of difficult because the types of transistors that were used in FM tuners in the 70s aren't readily available nowadays. So you have to be very resourceful about finding, and they have to be the exact part. You can't really substitute. It doesn't really work very well when you do that. So you have to be resourceful about where you know you can get them and build up a stockpile so you have them when you need them. Fortunately, it doesn't happen too often, so it's not a huge problem down here inside the inner chassis is our primary power supply which has been completely rebuilt. This original two section can capacitor has been restuffed. It has our shop's signature large diameter heat shrink tubing to seal it up and we, we ripped out the guts of it and replaced them with modern components keeping the original configuration and the original look. The heat shrink tubing is just to hold the can together and I think it looks okay when you do that. And down here, our big blue capacitor, it replaces this one that was bypassed years and years ago. And it is the correct value. And it's a, it's a screw thread type capacitor. This is something you would see more commonly in a commercial power supply or a, computer, a large computer, or not a home computer, a large commercial computer. Or, more of an industrial type application. It was chosen specifically because it's the right size. It fits in the, in the space we have available and it's the right diameter and it fits in the mounting bracket over here, which is a big bonus. So what I did was I removed the hacked in capacitor and rerouted the wires back to how they would have originally been connected. Since we have screw terminals, the wires were soldered into eyelet connectors and then heat shrink tubing was put over to the wire ends and the end of the eyelet connectors to give it some additional strength and to insulate it. And then they were screwed onto the capacitor in their correct polarities. So it's better probably than it was when it was brand new. And I like the big blue capacitor. I think it looks good sitting in there. 
And there you have it. That concludes the rebuild of a Newtone N2561 N2562 F chassis master station. In the end, it works very well. That that distorted kind of sound in the music that it had before we started is gone. It's nice and quiet as it should be, and all of the inputs work, and it's ready for another, well, it probably will go another 40 years at least before it needs any kind of work as long as everybody's nice to it. That's pretty much it. Got to call the customer so I can send it back to him. I know he's waiting for it. Yeah, I hope you found this interesting and perhaps helpful. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up on YouTube because that always helps. There'll be a banner right here that shows you how to subscribe. Go to our YouTube homepage, click on the bell or on the wheel, put in your email address, and every time we post a new video, you'll get a notification and you can watch it. That's all for today. See you on the next video.